Good afternoon, good morning, sabach al khair, bokir tov. Um, we are starting now our first joint webinar in the US of IPPNW, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and METO, the Middle East Treaty Organization. And um, without saying much more, my name is Sean Dolev, I'll be the moderator. I'm the executive director of the Middle East Treaty Organization. And, um, and now I'm very happy to present Kelsey Devonport. Um, Kelsey is the director for non-proliferation policy at the Arms Control Association, a non-partisan membership organization dedicated to promoting public understanding of and support for effective arms control policies. Kelsey focuses on the nuclear and missile program in Iran, North Korea, India, and Pakistan, and on the international efforts to prevent proliferation and nuclear terrorism. Thank you so much. And my thanks to the Middle East Treaty Organization and the International, um, this is the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War for, for hosting this event and inviting me to be here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be with you all to discuss the, these critical issues. And I want to begin, I think, by thanking Dr. Helfen for starting us off on what is a serious, but I think a very appropriate note uh, to remind us about the high stakes of these issues and, and the imperative for, for urgent action, because I, I very much agree with him that uh, a nuclear war, a nuclear accident is, is inevitable if we don't take swifter action to, to address this, this urgent risk. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between the nuclear deal with Iran and, and what I see as possible path forwards for the Middle East WMD free zone. Uh, and despite the challenges in progressing on his own and the challenges currently facing the nuclear deal with Iran, I'm optimistic about the future for both. I'm optimistic about the chances for restoring the deal and making progress on, on the zone. But you know, it's important to acknowledge that there are significant political and technical challenges to making progress on both of these issues. And some of these challenges are, are interwined. So I'm gonna organize my remarks first about looking at some of the political challenges and then moving to the technical side where I think that there may actually be some path forward even if we're not seeing progress in the political space. So first, and looking at the political dimensions of these issues, I, I think it's, it's, it's important to, to state what is a, quite obvious here, that, that Iran's nuclear program is sucking up a lot of the political oxygen, the political attention, and it's continuing to dominate Middle East WMD issues. And this is unfortunate because we saw from two years of implementation of the nuclear deal that the agreement was effective, it was verifiable, and that it had addressed the concerns posed by Iran's nuclear program. So the crisis surrounding the deal, the fact that it remains the center of political attention, and this was a manufactured crisis created by the Trump administration's decision to withdraw and reimpose sanctions on Iran in, in violation of, of the deal. Uh, but given that this is the reality that we're in now, uh, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that restoring the JCPOA, the nuclear deal with Iran, is going to continue to garner the attention of the three convening states, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia, that were charged under the 2010 NPA review conference with convening a conference uh, to begin discussions on how to establish a Middle East WMD free zone. Uh, and not only is it garnering the attention of the three conveners, uh, but also states in the region are clearly focusing their efforts on opposing the restoration of the nuclear deal with Iran. Uh, and in some cases, that's giving them, I think, an out from taking steps of their own to actually meaningfully advance the zone. So I begin that then just by saying that restoring the nuclear deal with Iran uh, may actually help open some political space and also add some impetus to negotiations on the zone. Because if states in the region are concerned about what happens after certain limits with the nuclear deal with Iran expire, and, and I do think there is reason to be concerned about what may happen uh, when some of those restrictions on uranium enrichment phase out, you know, regional restrictions you know, can be a positive way to both address their concerns about Iran, uh, but also advance the zone. Uh, so instead of looking at the JCPOA as insufficient, I think looking at the JCPOA through a regional lens as an option to help jumpstart some of those conversations on regional restrictions you know, could be helpful for switching that element of, of political momentum. 
I, I think though it's important to acknowledge that addressing the Iranian nuclear crisis, you know, could help facilitate conversations on its own. Uh, but it is not necessarily going to be sufficient, and nor should we depend on it to change the political space. I mean, the impasse that we've seen between Israel and the Arab group on a way forward for the zone, you know, has not been resolved, you know, by, 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 by changing some of the political tensions, you know, surrounding this issue, you know, over time. You know, for instance, you know, moving the issue out of the NPT context, you know, as we saw, you know, two years ago to begin a series of UN meetings to discuss the zone. You know, that also didn't address Israel's concern uh, about this issue being discussed, you know, outside of the NPT context. And despite the fact that we've seen, you know, generally good, you know, that we've seen opportunities for Israel and Egypt to work together on security issues in the past, you know, that relationship has not allowed them to overcome uh, their disputes over how to proceed on the zone. So I don't think we should depend on or, or, can, or think that the Abraham Accords themselves will be sufficient in terms of creating more political space uh, for the states in the region to discuss the prospect forward. Uh, on the zone. So again, you know, even though we've seen progress in the region when it comes to, you know, state to state, you know, relationships between groups that typically have had different views on the zone. Uh, and even if we think that issues surrounding the JCPOA may be resolved, again, you know, we can't rely on that to create the political space and momentum to actually advance the zone. Now, if whether or not that's true, I think will likely become more clear in August if the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference you know, takes place as, as scheduled. And how the zone issue fits into that conference, I think may give an indication if some of those political tensions between Israel and the Arab group over the past over the path forward, you know, will continue to exist, uh, or if recent, you know, if, if 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 recent efforts, you know, like the Abraham Accords, have changed that dynamic. But like I said, I, I'm not counting on on this being any different coming in in August. So to me, that raises the question: Is you know, is it advisable to move on to begin thinking about some of the technical issues that will need to be resolved or addressed in order to advance the concept of the Middle East WMD free zone? You know, we shouldn't forget that there's no precedent for the scope and magnitude of the zone that's being discussed in the Middle East. I mean, there are, you know, throughout the world, you know, nuclear weapons free zones, you know, some of which share similar features, some of which have their own distinct characteristics. Uh, but the Middle East zone itself, you know, encompassing biological weapons, chemical weapons, uh, delivery systems, you know, this is a hitherto unforeseen scope. So there's going to be a number of technical challenges that are unique to the zone that will need to be addressed. And I see some advantages to moving, you know, to, to a focus on uh, trying to address some of these already identified technical capacities. I mean, first, you know, states can take action in this space, you know, irrespective of political progress. So whether or not, you know, we see progress at the NPT review conference, whether or not we see progress at the JCPOA, you know, those don't have to be barriers for progress in, in, in the technical space. You know, furthermore, you know, if we do get to the point where we begin to see political momentum, you know, having had some of these discussions about technical barriers, having thought about some of the solutions, you know, that can help, you know, pave the way forward and continue momentum in the political space. You know, furthermore, I think it, thinking about technical objectives in the region can also help contribute to regional nuclear stability now. I mean, we shouldn't forget that the nuclear landscape in the Middle East is changing significantly you know, as states in the region consider nuclear power programs and the extent to which you know, they pursue these programs, how they pursue these programs. You know, we've seen you know, quite a spectrum. I mean, the United Arab Emirates, for instance, as it pursued nuclear power, I mean, took significant steps to ensure that it was in conformity with international best practices. You know, then on the other side of the spectrum, we see Saudi Arabia with ambitious nuclear plans, uh, but woefully insufficient safeguards. Uh, so again, focusing on some of these technical capacities, focusing on some of the elements could help, you know, add, an, add regional stability, uh, prevent states from pursuing nuclear hedging strategies, and simultaneously increase some of the nuclear security and safety concerns that come along with this move towards the civil nuclear programs in the region. 
So um, before I stop, I'll just throw out a few, you know, quick ideas. I mean, first, I think the work that the Middle East Treaty Organization is, is doing, you know, is, is critically important when we're thinking about the technical aspects of a treaty, actually thinking about some of the legal challenges, thinking about the text, thinking what needs to be included. I mean, that's critical capacity building work. And I, uh, you know, and I, and I, which I think, you know, needs to continue. And, and I commend them for, for, for their significant contributions in this area. Um, I think there are other things that you know states could be doing either unilaterally or bilaterally uh, or within a small multilateral group that again could answer some of these and address some of these technical obstacles you know some of that you know could involve elements that are relatively uncontroversial for instance you know building state adherence to the more intrusive and additional protocol inspections i think it's something that will need to be part of a zone that states can begin to do now that will show their support and begin to build confidence um, there are other conventions that you know may not be necessary for the zone itself, but in terms of again building that state capacity, uh, building up, um, you know, and, and 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 you know building momentum, you know things like the Convention on Nuclear Safety, another area that I think would increase confidence, increase stability when it comes to nuclear discussions sort of within the region. I also think that there could be some critical opportunities for collaboration on shared areas of concern that would contribute to a zone. You know, more exercises looking at nuclear detection, at counter nuclear smuggling. I mean, any incident of nuclear terrorism in the region, for instance, would have a significant, you know, regional impact. So this is areas where all states can benefit, again, less controversial, uh, and also would help build up those capacities, build those relationships, and build those technologies necessary to advance the zone. Um, so I'm going to stop there, uh, and I look forward to the comments from the other presenters and the discussion going forward. Thank you.